All right. Hello there. How is everybody doing? Everybody's doing good. Great. Enjoying their, uh, I guess, week so far. Well, the week really just starts only Tuesday, but anyway. Um, you know, this video is going to be about uh, the Terrence Crawford versus Israel Madrimov uh, fight that was this past uh, weekend. And, um, you know, for the most part, what I want to cover is uh, just a few of the fights on that card before I get to the main event, of course. Um, the first fight I want to cover that I could remember seeing, and I got to go back and watch that Steven Nelson fight, uh, but the Andy Cruz, Antonio Moran, uh, I thought it was a pretty good fight uh, from Andy Cruz. Obviously, I know this was a step up for him. Uh, Antonio Moran was, you know, at the time, 35-1. and one. And then you had uh, Andy Cruz, 3-0. and oh. But um, it was a really good fight. It was very calculating at first, but Andy Cruz started to eventually, you know, let his hands go. And he caught him with a mean, you know, vicious overhand. Uh, so overhand right. Uh, I like Andy Cruz's style uh, for the most part. He's definitely... Not the typical Cuban style that you're used to. Uh, he is a little bit more, you know, more aggressive. He is a, bit, a little bit more about getting in there if he does some good boxing. And currently, right now, he, you know, his main trainer is uh, Boise Ennis, which is like drawing. It's his dad. So, you know, I think he's doing a good job with him so far. Like, I like what I see, you know. Obviously, I understand he has an extensive, you know, background and, you know, the amateurs and everything like that. So that's why he's getting the fast track. Uh, but I definitely think he's pretty good for what he is, for where he's at at the moment. But yeah, that was a good fight. Uh, the next fight was Jared Anderson versus Martin Bacoli. Um, you know, that was a fight. Going into it, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, the only thing is, is I knew about Jared Anderson, and I didn't know about Martin Bacoli until, uh, you know, until the fight really got announced. And then they started bringing up his name. I think um, Eddie Hearn had mentioned it, and a couple of other of uh, the British broadcasts had mentioned his name. So... Apparently, he's one of this, like, he's like the boogeyman of the headweight division. So, and he's such a boogeyman, they kept his name buried. I didn't even, I didn't even know who he was, low-key like that. At least, you know, stateside in the U.S. But, either way, um, it started out where you had Jared Anderson, you know, going to Bacoli body. Uh you know, trying to establish that body jab and, and, you know, pretty much really go to that body before he get the range. But um, he was going for a nice body attack because really that's all Bacoli was giving him. But even then, those shots to the body seem to be like not having too much of an effect on Bacoli. But next thing you know, uh, Jared Anderson got a little bit more reckless, and then Bacoli started letting his hands go, and that's the di that's the difference. So Bacoli throws in some really good combinations, and he's very heavy-handed, from what I can see. Heavy-handed, fast hands too. He may not be the showpiece as far as you know, looking around and being athletic, but he does have fast hands. He has power, and his power is just. Is you know it's it comes without uh, effort because he even caught him with a couple of shots that just seemed like um yeah it was wild some of the shots he caught him with sorry yeah but eventually he ended up stopping him in the fifth round uh you know Jared Anderson. Definitely show heart. I mean, he was trying to get up from the assault. Uh, but Bacoli was just strong, man. Like, 
he just kept putting them down uh, with those combinations and uppercuts and his power was just something else uh, the one thing I would say Jared Anderson he tried to fight back and against somebody like him I think it would have been best to steal rounds not steal rounds but, but box him instead of try to fight him uh, because you know that you was faster you could have used that I think what happened was Jared Anderson got caught up in trying to really show his heart too much and what happened is he jumped in there he didn't really tie up he didn't really give himself time to recover uh, he he jumped in there and started fighting right back he didn't he didn't do the veteran tactics to try to save time so he could recover. And obviously that's a, a testament to him still being a young, you know, fighter. Obviously he can bounce back from this. He's still young. You know, he's a young heavyweight. He can bounce back, but it definitely showed um, his, um, his skill level. You know, he's, he's uh his ring IQ at this moment. Like, it's definitely, it's good, but obviously that was a situation he probably wasn't used to. But in that situation, you know, hopefully he'll be prepared for it in, in the future. Um, Martin Bacoli is a monster. You know, I don't know who's going to fight him. I think it would be great if uh, he fights uh, Joseph Parker. I think that would be a really good fight. Obviously, you know, Tyson Fury and Usyk got to fight uh, Anthony Joshua, and you know he has a fight as well. Uh, so I think it would be nice for for Martin Bacol and Joseph Parker to fight. You know, obviously later on, maybe down the line, obviously. And he just fought, so maybe early next year. But either way, I thought that was a really good, notable fight because I didn't really know who Martin Bacoli was, and so that just took me by surprise. Um, next up to that, you got Andy Ruiz versus Gerald Miller, um, the other big baby. So I didn't know, I honestly thought that, that Ruiz was going to win this fight, like easy, not even going to hold you. And the reason is, is obviously Gerald Miller you know, he's coming off of a knockout loss from what I remember. Um, it's, it's not that he was bad or anything like that. It just, it's wow. I think, who did he lose to? He lost to, uh, Daniel Dubois. Yep. Yeah, Daniel Dubois knocked him out. I remember that. And now he's fighting Anthony Joshua, obviously. But, yeah, um, you know, I guess this is how you went out for the loss, but he got that shot against Andy Ruiz, uh, a fight with Andy Ruiz, which is still a big fight in itself, former champion. Um, I'm not even going to lie. Like, I thought Ruiz uh, won this, I mean, lost this fight. I thought Miller, Miller did enough to at least win this fight. I, I get that it was a draw, and I get that there was moments where there wasn't enough action, but I really feel that in the moments that there was action, uh, Jerry Miller was taking over that fight, and he's not the guy who I had winning going into the fight. Like, I didn't even consider him to win. So, what I'm saying is, is um, I think that I, I think that the judges kind of did him wrong. And, you know, maybe they gave, you know, Ruiz a little bit more love than he should have got. Uh, a little hometown cooking, I don't know. But I honestly thought that uh, he lost that. And the reason is because um, he was tiring out. He was very visibly tired. Uh, Jarrell Miller had did it took a toll on him to do some work on with some earlier body shots that he kept, you know, piling in and, and racking up and putting in the bank. Um, those body shots started to pay off, and Ruiz 
started to visibly look tired. Like, he started to visibly look winded. Maybe by the fifth, sixth round, he looked like he was tired as, you know, as ever. And to, even though that time you had Jordan Miller not throwing some, doing some activity, throwing flurries, I still think that he effectively was in control of the fight of that time. Like, we used to throw some dangerous stuff, but he would block a lot of stuff and come back, rip to the body, and get him in the corner and just start throwing shots and punishing him. And that was kind of what the sequence was. So that I don't really, I don't really see how um he won, but you know it is what it is. Um, as for where they go from there, obviously Andrew Ruiz has to heal. I think he had an injury to his right hand. Uh, he had a bone popped out, and then on top of that, um, you know, I don't know where Jamir Miller goes from there. Maybe he can, maybe he could fight Jared Anderson, and, and uh, um, they could have a fight. Two of them, I mean, two big ba two babies against one another. Why not? So yeah, but otherwise, I thought it was a good fight. I did just think that Jamir Miller did enough to win. Uh, Ruiz took too much time off. That was two years off, so a lot of that ring rust was starting to show. And that's a big thing, you know. After that, what else do we had? We had David Morrell versus Radovo Kalajic. So that was a, it was a definitely interesting fight. Uh, David Morrell won by a unanimous decision. I thought it was a, a, a pretty close fight. But obviously, you know, the early rounds were probably banked by David Morrell, which had him win. But it was, you know, pretty one. It was. It wasn't like one one sided. Um, so I thought it was a pretty close fight. I can't remember too much about the fight because it was. It wasn't the most action in there either. Uh, David Morrell, you know, he was. He was throwing some things, but he wasn't always active and so um it definitely was an interesting fight but the fight i, I kind of want to even move past that because it was cool for what it was uh isaac cruz versus jose venezuela um yeah man um jose venezuela impressed me because a lot of people you know, had him losing coming into this fight. I mean, every time you looked up a boxer who gave his opinion, it was always um, Cruz. It was always a uh, pit bull. You know, Isaac Cruz was gonna take the fight and knock him out and get him out of there. And after what I seen him do to Rolly Romero, I kind of thought the same thing. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I mean. You got to realize something. I've seen him get knocked out by by lesser, you know, by different opposition. Then he he just got knocked out by Junior De Los Santos. So I thought, of course, maybe Isaac Cruz can knock him out. That's what I'm thinking. And the way that Jose Venezuela fight, um, usually, you would think he would play into the hands. A lot of the crews because they think it would get into a shootout, and eventually, you know, Jose Valencia said we get gunned down in the middle of a shootout, and that's what everybody kind of expected, uh, due to his previous, you know, his prior performances and things like that. But that's not what happened. No, he came in there. You know, I, you could tell he took everything very seriously. You know, obviously he kept saying for the most part. I'm dedicating this to my parents. Everything that's that in the third. Uh, when he got in there, he put on a boxing uh, clinic. Uh, now, the the keys to beat Isaac Cruz was there. It's just nobody did it. I mean, Tank kind of had the blueprint in their fight. Even though he fought that fight with one hand, he did move into the role of a boxer in the matador so he was catching you know he was catching uh cruz a lot of time with with you know check hooks 
and it like that and catching him coming in and mostly having him run into shots. And obviously he couldn't have knocked him out like he wanted to uh, because he injured his hand, but he showed that by boxing Cruz, you can beat Cruz. And so no one expected Jose Venezuela to do it, but he had the he had the um, patience to do it, and then the uh, you know, he had the discipline to do it, and he pulled it off. So yeah, what he really pretty much had did was he was boxing Cruz, stayed off the ropes as much as he can, caught him on the outside, kept him trying to catch him coming in, using his pretty much using his height and reach to his advantage. And Jose Venezuela was the taller man and the lengthier man. So he was using that reach, keeping Cruz on the outside. If they got on the ropes, he would get up as quickly as he could and really just kept it a boxing match and effectively outbox Cruz. Cruz was getting frustrated, rushing in there as much as he could to try whatever he could, but he was getting outboxed. And um, that's what happens. Uh, Congratulations to Jose Venezuela. I didn't expect, you know, that performance from him, but I think that was definitely uh, one of the best performances of the night. Uh, definitely something to remember. Um, yeah. And, and obviously, the next fight. Terrence Crawford versus Israel Majumov. Um, yeah, this fight was... Um, this fight was amazing uh, from a technical standpoint. Um, I do think that Crawford won this fight. Uh, hands down. I did watch. I really watched this fight like three times because I had to just. I had to just try to catch everything, you know, and, and I get it. Like it was very. It was a lot to process that first go around. I'm not even going to lie to you. And I think even in the first watch of the fight, I got thrown off by Israel Majumov's movement as well. So he had this, he had these constant feints and this constant, you know, irky jerky movement. And I know that movement was to obviously throw off Crawford so he can strike him and get in the inside and disguise his attacks. And it really became a, a game of counter the counter. Um, like he was trying to bait the counter out so he could counter the counter. And that's what it became, a very technical, uh, scientific match. And what you eventually, what I think would end up happening is, is that, first off, obviously you had Crawford who went out there swinging in orthodox, but the second... You know, that he went out there like that. Uh, I think Majumal probably responded quickly to that. Uh, he switched back, you know, to southpaw. Um, and I think he did that to take away, you know, Majumal's jab. Because when he did that, he wasn't able to use his jab as much as he would like. And from what I was able to gather from him in the past... Majorov builds a lot of his offense off the jab. So already you had Crawford um, nullifying one of his uh, greatest attributes right there. The the thing that threw me off like was the constant movement, but it was pressure. But what I would say is this. Even though he threw those constant face and kept, you know, Doing that, he did land a few strikes there. He didn't throw enough. Like he spent more time fainting than anything. Like he spent more time fainting and framing up and trying to get into the inside. I understand it. You're going in against Crawford because best believe every time he did faint and go in there, uh, and let's say he threw a strike and got in and out and he, he didn't get out the right way. Crawford was throwing heat. Crawford was throwing counters. You know, he was but not only throwing counters, he was throwing combos. Like after every time this man paid, he missed, he really was trying to make him pay. 
He was throwing combos. He wasn't throwing one shots. You know, so you could see, you could see that. I remember, you know, back then obviously the Crawford, the Spence fight. He was throwing counters, but he was like countering like on it, everything. He was throwing combos, so definitely showed a level to his speed and the punches that he picked. But uh, Crawford controlled the fight with his jab, <laughs> and I think that was the unsung hero of the night. Uh, after he switched to southpaw. He pumped that jab out and established that jab. And a lot of times he was able to disrupt Madrimov before he got too close or got too comfortable while he was throwing the feints. He had a game of adjustments. There was times Madrimov was adjusting, adjusting to the poke and jab of Crawford. And then Crawford adjusting to him, trying to do the slip, you know, throwing different hooks to catch him trying to slide out um it was beautiful Crawford had some beautiful body work in this fight I will say that um maybe it was that body work that made Majimoff a little leery about being you know out there like cause Crawford was he was throwing them body shots so a lot of times he countered to the body um, and obviously, you know, Magic Mop had to reset off that, so yeah. I thought it was, um, I thought it was an a interesting fight. Uh, Magic Mop definitely didn't fight his normal way, uh, and he fought extra careful in there. He was not trying to be reckless at all, and I understand. I mean, he's against somebody who he respects a lot, so. You know, he was on it with the feints. He knew that was the best thing he had because he knew he can just walk in the front door on Crawford, which is not going to happen. You can't just normally walk in his door. You're not going to let that happen. But otherwise, I thought it was a matter of if Crawford was controlling uh, Matchham off with that jab. But not only was he controlling with the jab, I think Crawford was, was throwing more punches and bunches. You know, obviously you have those times where he might get hit one shot and might move him or something, but they probably could hear the fierceness of those combos that Crawford was throwing and the reluctance of Matchroom off to attack all the time. Because he wasn't attacking as much as he probably could have been, especially if he's being a champion. He was more in a defensive posture than anything. And maybe that also didn't help that Crawford put him in that, that chop away. Because I'm telling you, he was throwing heat. Now, obviously, he didn't hurt, hurt him. I mean, he made him move and buzz him a little bit. Or not buzz him, but at least shook him a little bit here and there. But he didn't, like, hurt him, hurt him enough to, like, close the show. And obviously, like, there's a year rest there. This is your first weight up. Also, a new glove. So, that could play a big part into it all. But other than that, um, I thought it was, once again, like, a very, very great boxing match uh, at the highest level. And I thought Crawford was able to take control and to comfortably get that decision. I probably would have scored it, you know, going back. Um, 8-4, maybe, or 8-4. Yeah, 8-4 Crawford. Um, I thought that he won more of the rounds. I thought that he was being uh, a little bit more busy. I thought that he was being a little bit more aggressive off the counters and he seemed to be the one who was in control for the most part. Imagine off like I said became uh, the boxer and then 
Crawford became the stalker, boxer, counterpuncher. I don't even know anymore. But he was countering Majimov and he was trying to get him to lunch in there. And that's how he was catching him up, those counters. So eventually, those combos and making him pay all those times, I think that's what ultimately got Crawford that win. And I'm cool with it. Obviously, I know he didn't get the knockout and people probably wanted it, but people got to understand something. You know, it's always not going to be a knockout. And there's other qualities in that ring that when you fight something, knockouts. And I think Crawford displayed that. Like I said, people are going to say, you know, that it was a really, really tough fight, and it probably was, but he didn't, it wasn't like a damaging fight either. It wasn't tough because Crawford took a lot of damage either. I think it was tough because he was just trying to figure out the constant movement and the, and the feints and trying to get a read, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to hit him because it was hard to read him. I think maybe that's what they mean difficult, but it wasn't difficult if Crawford was getting battered in there and had to come back from a knockdown. But no, um, he didn't look like he was ever in that sort of trouble at all. At all. So yeah, um, I look forward to see you know what Crawford does in one fifty four. Um, Maybe he could fight Charlo. I don't know if Charlo's coming back. Or maybe he could fight, obviously, if they were trying to push um, Virgil Ortiz. So, that'd be a good fight. You know, they 